Here we'll prove the chain rule for finding derivatives of composite functions, and we'll see some examples too. Say you have a function y of x, and now let's look at a more complicated function, z of y of x. So for an input x, you compute y of x, and then you take y of x and put it into the function z. A function of a function is called a composite function. The chain rule is what will let us find the derivatives of composite functions. Here's an example. What's the derivative of the sine of 5x cubed? You know the derivative of sine is cosine, and you know how to find the derivative of 5x cubed. But what's the derivative of the sine of the function 5x cubed? To find out, we'll need the chain rule. To work out the chain rule, we'll use linear approximations. Suppose you have a function, which we'll call f of x. Let's look at the x-coordinate a, where the output of the function is f of a. If we look at a nearby point where the x-coordinate is a plus h, the output is f of a plus h. But if f of a plus h is hard to compute for some reason, we can approximate it using the tangent line at x equals a. This gray point is called the linear approximation for the purple point at a plus h. What's the y-coordinate for this linear approximation? We're interested in the y-coordinate of this gray point here, and we know the y-coordinate of this orange point here. That's just f of a. So what's f of a plus h? Or the approximation, that gray point? Well, it's approximately equal to f of a plus a small change in y. That small change in y, if you draw it over here, is a leg of a right triangle. The other leg of that right triangle has a length of h, and this part of the triangle is on a line whose slope is f prime of a. Another way of writing the slope is it's the change in y divided by the change in x. Here that's the change in y divided by the change in x, which is h. If we solve this equation for the change in y and plug it in up there, we find that the approximation is f of a plus f prime of a times h. Exactly. The y-coordinate of this gray point is f of a plus h times f prime of a. And this is the linear approximation. When h is small, f of a plus h can be approximated with f of a plus h times f prime of a. As h gets smaller and smaller, meaning the purple and orange points here get closer and closer together, this approximation becomes more and more accurate. Let's hold on to the linear approximation formula down here. And now let's tackle this derivative head on. Using the definition of the derivative, you can write the derivative of z of y of x as the limit as h goes to zero with an h in the denominator. What's the missing numerator here? The definition of a derivative usually looks something like this. The derivative of f of x is equal to the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. In this problem, instead of f, we have z of y of x. So every time we see f of something, we have to replace it with z of y of that same thing. Why don't you try making these substitutions in this definition and see if you can get the answer. Right. The numerator of this derivative is the composite function evaluated at x plus h, so that's z of y of x plus h, minus the function evaluated at x, which is z of y of x. Let's look at the y of x plus h inside the z here. We're taking the limit as h goes to zero, so h is going to be very, very small. If you apply the linear approximation to y of x plus h, what do you get? If you want to use the linear approximation formula, we now have to replace our function with y. So this f is going to become a y. And instead of an x, we have an a, 
is A is going to become an X. The right hand side is then Y of X plus H times Y prime of X. Excellent. Yes, for very small h, y of x plus h is approximately equal to y of x plus h times y prime of x. So let's plug this result back into the limit. And now we're evaluating z for the input y of x plus h times y prime of x. This is tricky, but can you apply the linear approximation again for this expression? As h gets very small, this whole term here, h times y prime of x, also gets very small. To start, why don't you call this a different small number, like p? So we're trying to find z of y plus p, where p is a very small number. Try using the local linear approximation on that. If we call this second term here p, then we're trying to find an approximation for z of y plus p. And that's approximately equal to z of y plus p times z prime of y. That's using this formula down here. And here we have z of y plus p instead of f of a plus h. So what's the first term? Well, that's z of y, and y is actually y of x, that's y of x. And p is h times y prime. So it's h times y prime of x times z prime of y. And y was y of x again. Very well done. Let's quickly see how you got that, using the linear approximation formula down here. z is the function we're looking at. y of x is like the point a, and the term inside the function z that's getting really small is h times y prime of x. So f of a in the linear approximation formula becomes z of y of x. The h over here becomes h times y prime of x, and f prime of a becomes z prime of y of x. Great. So this expression here is the linear approximation of the function z when h is really small. Let's plug this back into our limit. Now, can you evaluate this limit? Note that you have a z of y of x here and a minus z of y of x here. So those two will cancel out. Now you're left with just this expression here. Can you find the limit as h goes to 0 of that? Right. Looking at this limit, you saw that the z of y of x is subtracted over here, so these two terms cancel out. This is a limit as h goes to 0, but the only places where h shows up are here in the numerator and here in the denominator. These h's cancel out. And now that we've gotten rid of all the h's, we don't need to worry about this limit anymore as h goes to 0. So the derivative of z of y of x is this funny looking expression over here. This is one way to write the chain rule. But let's play with this expression a little. First, since we're multiplying these y prime and z prime terms together, we can switch their order. You know y is a function of x, so let's not bother writing the x over here. And here's the chain rule. The derivative of the composite function z of y of x is equal to z prime of y times y prime of x. To see what this means, let's try using the chain rule to work out the derivative of the function you saw earlier in this tutorial. Let's find the derivative of the sine of 5x cubed. First off, if you were to write the sine of 5x cubed as z of y of x, what are the functions y and z? The function y of x is going to be the first thing you do to x. In our example, the first thing you do to x 
is plug it into 5x cubed. So y of x is going to be 5x cubed. z is the thing that you do to y. What do we do with y or 5x cubed? We take the sine of it. So z, y, is going to be the sine of y. Right. In this formula for the chain rule, y represents the inner function, the one you're applying directly to the input x. So y of x equals 5x cubed. Once you have 5x cubed, z is the function you're applying to that output. So z of y equals the sine of y. Now that you've identified the functions y and z for this example, try using the chain rule to find the derivative of the sine of 5x cubed. To use the chain rule, we need to find z prime of y and y prime of x. z prime of y is the cosine of y, and y prime of x is 15x squared. So if you use the chain rule, z prime of y is going to be the cosine of y, and y prime of x is 15x squared. Now, we don't have any y's on the left side of this equation, so we shouldn't have any y's on the right. To get rid of it, we can just plug in using the equation that we have for y. Great job. Let's see how you got that. If z of y equals the sine of y, then z prime of y equals cosine y, since the derivative of sine is cosine. Now our original function here is the sine of 5x cubed. There's no y in this function. We just made up a function y and set it equal to 5x cubed. When we're finding the derivative of the sine of 5x cubed, the result should be another function of x. Let's replace the y over here with 5x cubed. So we see that z prime of y equals the cosine of 5x cubed. That's z prime of y. The chain rule says we're supposed to multiply that by y prime of x y equals 5x cubed. And to find the derivative of a power, you take the expression, multiply it by the power, and subtract 1 from that power, giving us 3 times 5x squared. 3 times 5 is 15, so y prime of x equals 15x squared. And that's how you found the derivative here. It's the product of z prime of y and y prime of x, which is the cosine of 5x cubed times 15x squared. The answer looks a little nicer if we put the trig function at the end. So we can say it's 15x squared times the cosine of 5x cubed. So great job with that one. Let's leave the result down here. And let's try one more example. Try using the chain rule to find the derivative of e to the tan of x. Again, you'll want to identify what the functions y and z are in this composite function, and then find z prime of y and y prime of x. The first thing this function does is it takes the tangent of x. So the inner function, or y of x, is equal to tangent of x. The second thing that you do is you take e to the output of that. So the second function, or z of y, is going to be e to the y. Why don't you try using those functions and the chain rule to figure out the derivative? If z is equal to e to the y and y is equal to the tangent of x, then z prime of y is just e to the y because the derivative of e to the y is e to the y. We can also write that as e to the tangent of x by substituting for y. What's y prime of x? Well, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So y prime of x is the secant squared of x. Now that you have y prime and z prime both in terms of x, you can plug them into the chain rule. Give it a shot. Good work. You identified y of x as being the exponent here, which is the tangent of x. And you found that z of y is e to the y. The derivative of tangent is secant squared, 
and the derivative of e to a power is also e to that same power. Since e to the tan x is a function of x, you replaced the y over here with tan x. And so the derivative of e to the tan x equals e to the tan x times secant squared x. Here are the derivatives you found for the two composite functions we looked at. So why is this called the chain rule? Well, if you're finding the derivative of z of y of x, first you find the derivative of the outermost function evaluated at the inner function, so that's z prime of y, and you multiply that by the derivative of the inner function evaluated at the input inside it, which is y prime of x. These steps are like links in a chain. This is the chain rule for taking the derivative of a function of a function. But the chain rule also works when taking the derivative of a function of a function of a function. What does that mean? Well, say you have a composite function that's composed of three functions, like w of z of y of x, and you want to find the derivative of this mess. Here's the derivative, and you can find it using the chain rule. First find the derivative of the outermost function evaluated at the function inside it, and you can keep working your way inward. So the derivative of w of z of y of x equals w prime of z times z prime of y times y prime of x. You can also get the same result by working your way outward. Start with the innermost function, which is y in this case, and find its derivative. Then multiply that by the derivative of the next innermost function, so that's z prime of y. And finally, multiply that by the derivative of the outer function, so that's w prime of z. You can apply the chain rule in either direction, inward or outward, and they both give you the same answer. In this tutorial, we'll try to get a better understanding of the chain rule. You use the chain rule to find the derivative of composite functions, like z of y of x. So first, let's focus on the y of x here. Here's a graph where you can make your own function y of x. When you're ready, press done. And now, you can make your other function z, which takes as an input y. So after you've finished making your function z of y, press done. And what you're going to see down here is the graph of z of x. It's z composed with y. y of x is drawn over here, and z of y, rotated 90 degrees, and you'll see why in a little bit, is drawn over here. Okay, so down here is our function z of x. Now at this point, you can drag your finger over the graphs and see the derivatives on all three. So right over here, here is dy dx, the derivative of y with respect to x. Here, if you rotate your head 90 degrees, you can see dz dy, the derivative of z with respect to y. And down here is dz dx. Try playing around with this a little. Make your own functions y and z. The first question is when is dz dx, this derivative down here, when is that derivative equal to zero? If we take the y of x and the z of y that are given to us, we'll see that we get a function z of x with many places that have horizontal tangent lines, or places where dz dx is equal to zero. Let's look at two of them. Let's look at this one here, and this one here. At this first point, you know that dz dx is basically zero. This small number here is close enough to zero. And dz dy is also basically zero. This doesn't look like a horizontal tangent line, but you have to remember the graph is on its side. So if you turn your head sideways, it is indeed horizontal. At the other point, over here, again, dz dx is basically zero. But this time, instead of dy or dz dy being zero, it's dy dx that's basically zero. Why don't you look for other places where dy dx is zero, or dz dy is zero, to see if they also give you zeros for dz dx.
you found that the derivative of this graph is zero when either the derivative of this graph is zero or the derivative of this graph is zero. Now as you move your finger around, you can see the exact values of the three derivatives reported down here. Looking at these three derivatives, is there a relationship between them that always seems to be true? If we take a look at this point here, we see that dy dx is equal to 2, dz dy is equal to 1.46, and dz dx is equal to 2.92. Try plugging in these three values to each of the equations over here and see which equation turns out to be correct. Okay, so you found that dz dx always equals dz dy times dy dx. Let's look at the derivatives and see if we can figure out why that is. dx represents a small change in x, so it's the width of this blue bar here. And dy represents the corresponding small change in y, so it's the width of this orange bar. And dz you find by looking at the change in z. So that's the width of this green bar over here, which also happens to be equal to the width of this green bar down here. So you can think of dx, dy, and dz as being small changes in x, y, and z. So when you look at this equation again that you came up with, the dy's cancel out. And that leaves you with dz over dx on both sides. So if dz over dx equals dz over dy times dy over dx, you should be able to make this term negative and this term negative and get a positive value for dz dx. Make it so. If you want both dy dx and dz dy to be negative, if you want both of these to be less than zero, that means both of the tangent lines on those graphs should have a negative slope. Now a negative slope in this y versus x graph should look something like this, and a negative slope in the z versus y graph, remember to turn your head sideways, should look something like this. So why don't we look for a place where the y versus x graph has a negative slope, and the z versus y graph also has a negative slope. So here, you'll notice that this purple line matches the slope that I drew here, and this purple line matches the slope that I drew here. So they both have a negative slope. And notice, that the z of x graph at this point has a positive slope. That's exactly what you want. Okay, so given the composite function z of y of x, you found that dz dx equals dz dy times dy dx. Another way to say this is that the derivative of z with respect to x equals the derivative of z with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to x. You might have noticed that this looks similar to the chain rule, which is the rule you use to find the derivative of composite functions like this one. Suppose you want to find the derivative of this composite function, z of y of x. What does the chain rule say this derivative is equal to? Right, the chain rule says that the derivative with respect to x of z of y of x is z prime of y times y prime of x. Now let's see if we can find another way to write this formula. Let's start with the y prime of x term over here. What's another way to write this highlighted expression? Exactly y is a function of x, so you can rewrite y prime of x as dy dx. Similarly, we can rewrite z prime of y as dz dy. Finally, let's look at this expression over here. Inside the brackets here, we have the function z, and we're taking the derivative of z with respect to x, meaning we're looking at how z changes as x changes. So how can we rewrite this highlighted expression? Yeah, this is the derivative of z with respect to x, so we can write this expression as dz dx. So this relationship among the derivatives that you found earlier in this tutorial 
is exactly the chain rule. As you saw earlier, you can think of the dx, dy, and dz terms in the chain rule as small changes to x, y, and z. So this equation isn't too surprising. The dy terms in the numerator and denominator cancel out, leaving us with dz over dx equals dz over dx. But let's put the dy's back in. This is the simplest way to write, as well as to remember, the chain rule. Okay, last question. Let's put the chain rule to work. Consider the function e to the minus x squared. That's e, and the power it's being raised to is minus x squared. What's the derivative of this function? If this expression here is z, then what we're trying to find is dz dx. To do that, we'll first find dz dy and dy dx for some intermediate function y. What's y? Well, y is the first thing that we do to x. Here, the first thing we do to x is take minus x squared. So let's say y is minus x squared. If y is minus x squared, then we could write z as e to the y. What's dy dx? Well, that's going to be minus 2x. And what's dz dy? Well, the derivative of e to the y is just e to the y, so that's e to the y. Finally, you can plug everything into the chain rule. So dy dx goes here, and dy dz dy goes there. Now, just remember, you don't want any y's left over, so you're going to have to plug in for y using your expression over here.